Hello and welcome back to Warcraft Daily for today, the 3rd of February 23rd. No, 2014. Nearly did it again. Anyway, so today's news is really just going to be a summary of all the different things the developers have been saying recently, which is going to be interesting um, in itself. But honestly, I think we all know that the, uh, the kind of news schedule for World of Warcraft is kind of... It's in the doldrums at the minute, really. There's not a great deal going on. And I'm beginning to think that if they want to keep the hype going for Warlords of Draenor, they're, they're going to need to do more. Like, I know we did have that character reveal maybe two weeks ago. But it, I don't know, it just feels to me as if things are kind of slowing down a little bit, and that is not what they need, given the fact that EverQuest next uh, landmark was out in Alpha today. Um, in two months, we're going to have Elder Scrolls Online, and maybe a month or two after that, we're going to have Wildstar. Uh, well, okay, either actually... They're, I think what could happen is maybe they're just saving a lot of the hype and use things for that period where all those games are coming out, and then just right now they are they're just kind of chilling on it. So yeah, I'm not really sure what's going, sort of going on in that regard, but let's get into what we do have for news. So first of all, tweets, and these are going to be from Watcher, who is Ian Hasakostas, who is the main encounter guy. He said that a final tier heroic only boss is probably unlikely because it would just upstage the final expansion's boss. Or the, the ex um, expansion's final boss. That absolutely makes sense. Um, it would be pretty shit if you were to say kill Garrosh. Then it turned out the ultimate MacGuffin was actually behind him, then you had to kill him too. Honestly, I feel like the like the heroic version of an expansion's final boss should be of the difficulty of one of those special heroic only bosses like Sinestro or Raden. Now that said, Radan's perhaps not the best example because he actually wasn't... Okay, he was very hard, but he wasn't as hard as maybe Le Shen, as an example. Basically, they didn't get enough testing in on Radan. I'm not too sure if they let guilds in to, to kill him. So because of that, the boss had one or two little things which allowed it to be easier. A bit of a pity, and they definitely do need to watch out when they're doing more of these heroic-only bosses. Still, they're a very good idea, and it's nice to have some sort of cool thing that we can just follow with the entire race to world first sort of idea and um yeah i don't know it, it's really fun just watching these extremely hard boss fights and even just seeing how they play out even if i like i personally will probably never get to play them but anyway so that's kind of cool next he said that they want to get rid of loading screens during encounters this is really just any time that you get phased in somewhere so i'd say most notably in garage where you're phased between the two um like the heart of yasharaj things Instead of doing a loading screen, he said they basically would rather do a short stun. And the reason for that is just to allow everyone to zone in to the place. Um, so that, that's kind of cool. Now one thing I did sort of notice, um, when I, I'm using the uh, the camera technique that I'm using at the minute, I can set a waypoint anywhere within the kind of loaded instance. So I could be at the very top of Kalimantor, set waypoints in, or to set up things, I and mean, then maybe, or Kalimantor. Then set up all these things in, say, Uldum, then hit a button, instantly my camera's transported to Uldum. So it's not like loading things that are far away is completely unfeasible, and since it's a raid encounter, there's not a great deal. Why do they even need a loading screen? I think they should just do that short stun and let people load in. That makes far more sense. So next, with Warlords, he said that, um... Yes, players, they will be able to release their spirit inside instances when they die. Now, why is that really nice? Well, it cuts out a load screen. Okay, there's maybe that five second walk from the initial graveyard to the entrance of the instance. But honestly, why was that even there in the first place? It, it was a bit of a waste of time. I'm guessing it was just some like random technical issue where they needed you to zone back in to the instance. But it's nice that that's fixed. The more convenience, the better. And um, I don't know, sometimes in, in Siege of Orgrimmar, it got a little bit annoying with the corpse runs. And things like that. I nearly feel like um, I wish I was just able to mount up inside the Underhold, especially for things like, say, Thok the Bloodthirsty, because sometimes that, like, that walk is definitely a little bit too long, in my opinion. Anyway, so next, speaking of raids, he said that the first raid in Warlords of Draenor, which is called High Mull, will have a large outdoor segment that will be sort of similar to the Firelands in terms of structure. I think this is pretty nice. Um, outdoor things are generally good, it means you can mount up. And uh, sometimes it's just when you're stuck inside all the time, it's a little bit, it's just annoying, kind of. Now, hopefully, um, by having this uh, being an outdoor instance, it means that there will be a little bit of non-linearity in it. It would be nice if we could maybe, I don't know, I think it's six bosses in it, so maybe if the last two we need to do in a certain order, but the first four you can just do however you want. I think that would be nice, actually. 
Okay, actually, may maybe we just make it so that the first boss is one that everyone has to get through, because that makes sense in terms of being a first boss. But maybe the next three or four, you just, um, you just gotta do it in whatever order you, you please. Now, this, since this is the very first instance in the expansion, and they're planning on getting a few people, well, not a few, quite a few people, into raiding with this, I guess they, they probably won't go for ultra high and linear and non linearity because that could be a little bit confusing. Still though, it's very important they bake that into more of their raids, and I think Siege Vorgamar definitely suffered from the fact that it was a 14 boss straight line nearly. Apart from a, a little bit of deviation at the end, but honestly, it didn't really it didn't do the job, I suppose. Next, he said that there are going to be more and more to come in terms of their plans for dungeons. They haven't said everything yet. And that in one of the recent interviews, and it was in an interview that I covered, where they said that they will be adding or catering for hard mode difficulties with more rewards. That was actually a mistake in the transcription. And what he actually said is that they would like to give more rewards for harder dungeons. So in combination with him saying that and that they have more to come in terms of plans, Perhaps there is some sort of harder difficulty mode. I'm pretty sure I've heard though that Mythic Dungeons is off the table for launch, so I'm not particularly sure exactly what they'll do. Of course, if you want to hear more about Mythic Dungeons, just look at my video from February the 1st. I think it's quite good, and a lot of other people did too, so that was nice. And next, let's move on to another blue poster, and we have Dave Mald uh, Maldonado. He's just one of the game designers over there, I think he's a senior game designer, so definitely been there for quite a while. Anyway, he said that a long time ago, they planned on having a casting animation for staves and weapons. Now, what do I think of this? Well, personally, I think shooting fireball out of a, maybe the lightsaber mage sword would have been pretty damn cool. And it kind of almost just felt a little bit off to me, having a stave and never using it. I kind of like the Gandalf method of using staves. I think they have always done that sort of well in Lord of the Rings. and More so, I suppose, in... Uh, in The Hobbit. That said, I don't think the second Hobbit movie is very good, but that's probably a discussion for another time. Yeah, it would be nice to have our staves and wands and things like that actually be involved with spell casting, but I'm not too sure how they prevent it from looking cheesy. That said, I think they should. St it's still something they could have a look at. Um, Dave did say that, look, it, it's not being worked on currently, but hey, maybe someday it would be nice. And yeah, it, w it would be nice, especially from staves. Next, let's move on to Celestian, and he said that they are going to be making a much larger effort um, if, to fully explain the reasoning behind the various changes they make in expansions. Basically, he said that in expansions they make a great deal of changes, but historically they have not done the best job of really explaining those effectively to people. It definitely is important that they explain things well, and one of the nice upshots of this is that when they explain the reasoning, the feedback that they will get from players is perhaps a little bit more valid and worthwhile. So that's definitely a nice thing. One thing we should caution, though, is you don't want to completely open up development to players because there's a thing in game design, players don't know what they want, and that is true. A lot of people are going to say, I want no repair builds, I want, like, 300% speed flying mounts, I want to teleport to more places, um, I want, e you know, easier dungeons so I can do them quicker, blah, blah, blah. A lot of things like this, um, players will say they want them, then they'll, if they ever made it into the game, the game would be far, far worse for it. It's, uh, it's just a design thing, so hopefully they just kind of use this enhanced level of feedback as, uh, I don't know, just a, a pool of ideas, but not necessarily something that they take a great deal of stock in. It's important to listen, but if you listen too much, then it turns into this weird design by committee where your players form the committee, and that is generally not very good, because if you have, say, 5,000 people designing your game, then a lot of things are going to end up being lowest common denominator decisions, meaning they're meant to just sort of appeal to the masses, but not really be that good for anyone, and that is not a good way for a game to be. Next, he said that the Tyrael's Charger Mount is going to be on the store, because the annual pass was not available in some regions. Well, I don't know, I mean, uh, whatever. What regions was not available in? I thought it was okay in pretty much all of Europe and the US. I, uh, it's it's kind of weird, like, they, the Jade Pig, those little pig mounts that they had um, in the game, they were exclusive to China. But honestly, I think if something was exclusive to China, then maybe just sell it in the other regions, but leave it being exclusive to the, chi to the, um, the China region, because I think the Chinese players who did whatever they, they needed to do to deserve that mount, perhaps it's okay that they um, they get to have it on their own. Or perhaps it, the Tyrael's Charger mount is just going to be something that will be available in other regions, like, I don't know, Korea and 
what other, other whatever other places did not have the annual pass system. I'm not particularly sure. I haven't done a great deal of, of working out for it. Uh, well, that, that sentence made no sense. Sorry, I'm, I'm really tired. Um, so, yeah, whatever, Turtle Charger, leave your thoughts in the comments. That would actually be interesting to know if you, if you did participate in the annual pass. Then finally, Celestian said that loot catch-up is there for many reasons, but one of the main ones is they want to keep the player base centralized. Well, that's interesting, and I suppose that's fair enough, but one thing is that every single major patch like this, especially when a patch like, say, 5.4 goes on for more than three months, um, which has not really happened previously in MOP, but what happens with, 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 with that is that players really burn out quick. I don't think anyone is that enthused about Siege of Orgrimmar or Garage or anything like that at the minute, so that's it's definitely an issue, and loot catch-up is something that contributes to that issue, because players don't have that older content as being a buffer. Honestly, I'm okay with loot catch-up in principle, and when they say loot catch-up, I think they just mean mechanics like uh, the Timeless Isles. Now, I think the Timeless Isles was perhaps maybe a little bit too much. Um, it could have maybe done with being, I don't know, 490, 489 rather than 496. Actually, well, hmm, it depends. You see... That gear basically completely cut out... Actually, I think LFR is the real problem here. Okay, so hear me out. Right, this, um... The whole gearing strategy for this, for 5.4, was you do the Timeless Isles, then you do LFR, then you do Flex. Then you just go as high as you want, essentially. Now, that completely cuts out the previous tier. I'm, I'm still okay with the idea of going back to the previous raid tier in either Flex or Normal mode, being a legitimate way to gear up. I guess that the item level increases from exp from tier to tier have been so large that that was really not very viable, but if they were a little bit more reined in given the item squish and things like that, I'd be okay with just providing that old content as being something that you can still do to get gear which is semi-useful in the next patch. I'm okay with, say, every single piece of gear that you have from the older tier being replaceable within the first, like, six, seven, eight bosses, whatever, that's fine. But in terms of the item level difference, I think it probably would be nice if you could, uh, maybe, I don't know, if you're having a bit of a problem with one of the siege bosses, then you could jump back to Throne of Thunder, get some more gear there. It, it is a bit of a problem, and by sticking every, like, every player with every patch up to a certain bar, then they cut out all the content before that bar. So anything before item level 496 is cut out from the game, and 496 is pretty high item level. Honestly, I think that if LFR was not a part of the game's main gear progression, then it would level things out a little bit more nicely, because they wouldn't have to, with the item level jumps in between tiers, they wouldn't have to deal with LFR being one of those item level jumps. Therefore, they could probably place flex and normal and heroic and all the different modes in a little bit more of a uh, kind of sensical position. Uh, it's it's weird. It's, it's an interesting debate, actually. I'll probably do a discussion video which... T covers and topics like this, but right now my head's really woozy and I'm tired, so I'm not going to. Uh, next, let's just move on to some things from Dave Kosak. He said that they're not looking to redo the Burning Crusade at any point in the near future. Basically, it pulls them away from new content, and I think that's absolutely the right decision, and it's fair enough. He also said that Aurelia and Terulion are doing fine, and personally, my bet is on them returning in the next expansion, and uh, that is, of course, assuming that the next expansion is Burning Legion related. Basically, I think the next Legion expansion will be the one in which we see these two characters return, and it should be pretty cool. Then he also very interestingly said that we are going to be hearing about Tyrus Falls soon enough. Now, if you don't know what he means there, essentially there is this thing in Tyrus Falls, like uh, this circle and all these Fey Dragons and the kind of like creatures of, of that zone that gather around in this circle and do some weird ritual thing. Now, there's that in combination with the fact that if you go into some part of Tyrus Fall and turn all of your sound effects to a certain setting. Um, I think it's max out your sound effects and then drown out like music and all those things, turn them off. Then you will hear a heart beating and the rattling of chains. A bit of a weird thing is when I tried to look that up recently, I couldn't really find much in the way of references to it on the different World of Warcraft wikis, but I definitely remember even seeing it back in the day myself. So it's definitely a thing, it's definitely there, and he said earlier that it is not an old god, but that it's really just more of a plot hook for when they could possibly need one. Well, perhaps this is him saying, we maybe have our plot hook in the works. Next, he said that Raffian took the name off Prince for himself, and really, considering the, that he murdered all the other black dragons, I don't think there was much opposition. He also said that they wanted there to be more gnomes around in sort of in-game portrayal. 
And then later on, a follow-up tweet, he also said, working on night elves. Really, you could say it for everything that's not humans and orcs. In some regard, we haven't seen much of dwarves in a very interesting capacity since all that Council of the Three Hammers stuff in Wrath. Um, I don't know, it's... It, it's just weird. In a game like World of Warcraft, they have a very limited capacity for storytelling, just out of the nature of it being an MMO and the ways that you can do storytelling in an MMO. So, not really sure how they're going to ideally work something like that out. They don't want it to just, like, just feel like this big old freak show where every single race gets its 15 minutes of fame and they rotate between the lot of them. I don't know if that's a... That's, well, no, that's not I don't know. I, I do know that that's not a good way of doing a story. Then finally, he said that Aethys Sunreaver was caught between loyalties, and he decided to look the other way during the Divine Bell incident. So, yeah, that Jaina was kind of right in uh, her decision. Well, she was right in thinking that they kind of betrayed us, so it's okay that we wipe them out. There was at least reasoning there. So, anyway, that was interesting to hear. Now, there are a bunch of realm connections, but honestly, this show's went on for long enough, and I don't want to completely destroy my tongue, plus there's a bunch of French ones that I know I won't be able to pronounce, so you can go and look them up on the official forums. Uh, that's it for today's show. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and I'll see you next time.